They promised innovation, they delivered frustration. From frozen desktops to billion-dollar failures and lost dreams, these are the operating systems that crashed harder than their users' patience, each one a reminder that progress sometimes needs a complete reboot. Windows Longhorn, the dream that melted mid-flight. Between the glory of XP and chaos of Vista, Microsoft whispered a single word, Longhorn. They promised glassy transparency, instant search, 3D graphics that felt alive. This was the future, your PC reimagined. But we got a Frankenstein of ambition and bugs. Longhorn was Tex Icarus. It flew too close to the sun on glossy arrow wings and melted mid-flight. Every week, leaked builds appeared online, each more unstable than the last. Boot it up and you'd be lucky if the desktop appeared before the crash report. Developers called it Vista's haunted prototype. Fans called it Windows XP with delusions of grandeur. It had dreams, but no discipline. By 2005, Microsoft hit the panic button and scrapped everything. What rose from its ashes became Windows Vista, which wasn't exactly redemption. Windows Longhorn wasn't just bad software, it was a public meltdown, a cautionary tale of shipping a patch and calling it revolution. MS-DOS 4, when an update made everything worse. Before Windows, before GUIs, before the mouse became king, there was DOS, simple, reliable, until version 4 showed up like a drunk uncle at a family reunion. MS-DOS 4 was supposed to be the next step, more powerful, more efficient. Instead, it crashed so often that users joked it stood for mostly stops doesn't operate successfully. It froze, it corrupted files, it refused to talk to hardware that worked perfectly in older versions. Imagine upgrading your car only to find it can't drive uphill anymore. That was DOS 4. Sure, it introduced neat ideas, a rudimentary graphical interface, mouse support, even color options, but none of it mattered when your system locked up copying a file. For many, it was the first realization that updates could make things worse. When DOS 5 arrived and fixed the mess, users cheered like prisoners being released. MS-DOS 4 was left behind, a relic of instability buried under its own bugs. BOS, beautiful engineering, zero market penetration. BOS was created as a clean, modern operating system designed for multimedia, Long before multimedia meant streaming multiple videos while your browser eats RAM, it focused on high responsiveness, low latency, and efficient multithreading. BOS achieved this by being built from scratch instead of inheriting legacy code. Its BFS file system supported extended attributes, allowing files to behave like tiny databases. Its kernel was optimized for symmetric multiprocessing, scaling extremely well with multiple CPUs when most systems were single core. The interface was simple, clean, and fast. On paper, BOS looked ideal for digital audio, video editing, and creative production. The problem? Almost nobody shipped hardware for it, and almost nobody wrote software for it. B Incorporated tried partnering with Apple in the mid-1990s. Apple bought Next instead. They then targeted the consumer PC market, but Windows already dominated. Microsoft's licensing agreements discouraged CPU manufacturers from shipping multiple operating systems. The result? Excellent engineering, almost no market penetration. By 2001, B Incorporated dissolved, and BOS joined the list of brilliant operating systems born in the wrong decade. Solaris, the Unix giant that slowly aged out. Solaris, developed by Sun Microsystems, was one of the most respected Unix operating systems in enterprise. It powered data centers, universities, and financial institutions throughout the 1990s and 2000s. Unlike most systems here, Solaris didn't fail technically. It failed because of corporate acquisition, shifting priorities, and declining relevance as the world standardized around cheaper platforms. Solaris introduced advanced technologies before they became standards. Its ZFS file system provided snapshots and data integrity checks. Its container system allowed isolated environments before containerization went mainstream. Its multiprocessing support made it ideal for large servers. The pivotal moment came in 2010 when Oracle acquired Sun. Under Sun, Solaris had open development with community participation. 
Oracle closed the source code, halted public bills, and shifted to a slow proprietary release cycle. Developers migrated to Linux where development remained open. Organizations moved away from Spark systems due to cost. By 2019, Oracle placed Solaris into sustaining support. Corporate language for don't expect anything, no. Solaris quietly aged out while faster, cheaper platforms took over. Windows ME, Millennium Edition, or Massive Error. The year 2000. Everyone thought computers would explode from Y2K. Microsoft's answer? Windows ME. Officially, Millennium Edition. But for anyone who used it, it meant Massive Error, the OS that crashed before you could hit Save. It was supposed to be the fun, family-friendly upgrade to Windows 98. Instead, it was a bridge to frustration. Programs froze mid-launch, drivers disappeared overnight, and the blue screen of death became daily ritual. Microsoft stuffed every possible bug into one shiny box and said, good luck. Sure, it added Internet Explorer 5.5 and Windows Movie Maker, but what's the point of editing videos if the system crashes before rendering? Within a year, users fled back to Windows 98 or waited for XP, which felt like salvation. Windows ME wasn't just bad software, it was a public meltdown, a cautionary tale of shipping a patch and calling it revolution. Windows 8, when Microsoft forgot who its audience was. Windows 8 was the moment Microsoft forgot its audience. In an age where tablets and smartphones were rising, they tried to merge it all, one interface to rule them all. The result? A system that didn't know what it wanted to be. Gone was the beloved Start button, replaced by giant, tile-covered touchscreen layout that looked like a toy store display. Users booted it up and froze, staring at colorful squares, asking, where's my desktop? Simple actions like closing windows turned into puzzles. There were gestures nobody knew existed, settings buried under confusion layers, and the infamous charms bar that appeared only when you moved your mouse just right an OS that punished you for not being psychic. To their credit, Windows 8 introduced faster boot times, better security, and modern design language, but none of that mattered when people couldn't figure out how to shut down their computers. Windows 8 wasn't just a design failure, it was a failure of empathy, a system made for touchscreens in a world still running on keyboards and mice. Symbian OS, the mobile giant that couldn't touch the future. Symbian OS began as a joint effort to build a powerful, efficient operating system for early smartphones. Long before smartphone meant much, it was engineered for devices with limited memory and low power processors using microkernel architecture and event-driven design. For years, Symbian dominated the global smartphone market. Nokia, Sony Ericsson, and other manufacturers built entire product lines around it. The system supported multitasking, background services, advanced telephony controls, and early app installation before app stores existed. However, development required knowledge of Symbian C++, a custom language variant with its own memory management conventions. Even simple applications demanded understanding of descriptors, cleanup stacks, and system-specific patterns. Many developers called it powerful but exhausting. When the iPhone launched in 2007, the industry shifted toward capacitive touchscreens and fluid interfaces. Symbian was designed for keypad navigation and stylus-based systems. Retrofitting for touch required compatibility layers that produced inconsistent experiences. Nokia attempted modernization with S60 Touch, Symbian Ana, and Symbian Bell, but the core architecture still reflected tiny displays and button navigation. Android offered unified development and rapidly growing ecosystems. The final turning point came when Nokia partnered with Microsoft for Windows Phone. Symbian's developer ecosystem collapsed overnight, officially ending in 2014. It failed because it was engineered for early 2000s constraints and couldn't reshape quickly enough for the touchscreen era. Lindos, the bold imposter. Back in 2001, developers had a bold idea. Take Linux, dress it up like Windows, and sell it to the masses. They called it Lindos. 
The goal, make Linux easy while giving Microsoft a headache. The problem, it barely worked. Lindos promised you could run Windows applications on Linux using Wine compatibility layer. In theory, freedom. In practice, crashes, bugs, and the sad realization that your favorite program still didn't run. Then came the legal storm. Microsoft sued, claiming the name was too close to Windows. The case made headlines, and unbelievably, Lindos won. But victory didn't save them. Microsoft eventually paid $20 million just to buy the name, and Lindos quietly rebranded to Linspire. Despite clever ideas, the dream fizzled. Too slow for Linux fans and too weird for Windows users. Lindos became tech history's punchline, proof that you can't copy greatness with duct tape and wishful thinking. It didn't just blur the line between Linux and Windows, it tripped over it, sued someone, and disappeared into obscurity. Every crash, every failure, every fatal error in this list built the systems we use today. Progress doesn't come from perfection, it comes from the bugs, the glitches, and the courage to start again. So the next time your computer freezes, just remember, at least it's not running Lindos. If you enjoyed this journey through tech history's greatest disasters, hit that like button and drop a comment with the failed OS you remember, or the one you're glad you dodged.